Hello everyone, I'm happy to be with you on this second day of DConf Online 2020. My name is Ali Chehrili. I'm a person who has been with the D community since 2009. As soon as I read Andrei Alexandrescu's The Case for D article, I translated it to Turkish, created a Turkish D site. I'm known for the free book programming in D, which I consider to be a happy accident which has recently been released on Educative I.O. as an interactive course in two parts. I currently work at Mercedes-Benz Research and Development North America. We use D for ROS bag file manipulation for autonomous driving. And if you click that link, you will get to my DConf 2019 presentation on the topic. This is a project between Daimler and Bosch, which I consider to be a happy place. Everything that I'm going to present today has been used in that project. Before going forward, I recommend that you use AutoRap if you want to expose your decode to Python. Just by importing AutoRap and mixing in this expression, uh, for example, any functions, exported functions in your my module and my other module will be exposed as Python functions. Even names that are camel case on the D side will magically appear as snake case on the other side. D exceptions will be translated to Python exceptions and everything will work. To learn more about AutoRap, you can read Attila Neves' blog posts on the topic. And you're already there if you want to expose your D code, even C code, to Python. But my presentation will be not directly exposing the Python, but first exposing your D code as a C library, which will also be available for, uh, from Python. This involves symbols, function interfaces, error propagation, object lifetimes, library interfaces, and initializing the D runtime. After talking about those, I will give you an example on how to expose a D range object to C. And once we do that, we, we will be able to call the same library from Python. The numbers you see at the bottom of the slides are not number of slides, but they are, but they are number of clicks that I go through the slides. Compilation is what the compiler does. It reads your source code and produces object code. Looking at this example module called Dename, I have one function in it called add. It adds two integers. We can compile this module with the dash C command line option to the compiler. DMD comes with a command line tool called object to assembly, which can disassemble compiled code. If you run object to assembly on your generated deneme.o object file and look inside, <coughs> look through that uh, disassembled code, you will notice that there are these cryptic names in there. And if you squint enough, you can notice the name of the module deneme and the name of the function add appears in there somewhere. The rest is just the CPU instructions that the compiler generated. The reason for the cryptic names in the compiled code is D's function overloading feature. D allows us to have the same name for more than one function. As in this case, I have two add functions. One of them adds integers, the other one adds doubles. Because of name mangling, we get these unique names in the compiled code. Now, if you compile this code and look into the symbols, you will notice that the differences are in the I and D letters, presumably meaning int and double parameters and return type. There are other ways of observing symbols. This is outside of my topic, but I will tell you GNU bin Util's NM program lists symbols in object files, libraries, or programs, and it gives more information. As in this case, um, we define the two add symbols as weak symbols, but DDSO registry is an undefined symbol, which probably our module wants to call out to some other place. There's another feature in D, if you're interested in, if you have a need for getting the symbols at compile time, you can write a loop like this, static for each, going through all overloads of the name add of the module deneme and dot mangle of gives you the mangled name of uh, your symbols. And I get the same mangled name mangled symbols. Linker is a program that combines object files and libraries together to make an executable. 
to make a program. So to see an example, let's add another uh, module to our alongside our derima.t and we will call this main.t which imports the previous uh, module, calls a function of that module. In this source code, even though we see add one comma two and the compiler sees this as a uh, call to the int version of add, behind the scenes, this is actually a call to that name mangled function. So we can compile these two modules separately with the dash C option for each of them, which will produce dot O versions of them. And then we link them. Interestingly, linker is almost never seen in our builds because the linker is called behind the scenes by DMD. So you can call DMD with these two dot O files and it will call the linker to link them. One module will define a symbol, the other module will use that symbol, so everything will be linked together as a program. Languages differ when it comes to name mangling. Uh, we've already seen how the D language, DMD, name mangles these two functions. C++, for example, with G++, produce shorter mangled names because C++ does not have modules yet, so they don't need to use the module name in these uh, symbols. And C is interestingly produces the same symbol because it doesn't have name mangling, because it doesn't have overloading. So because we need to go to C uh, as our library interface, and because C doesn't have overloading, we have to name mangle our symbols ourselves. Historically, C happens to be the common language and we're trying to get there. Extern C tells the compiler to use unmangled names, just like C does. So we have to define all our library functions extern C. And then, because C doesn't have overloading, we have to name mangle them. I just chose underscore int and underscore double as my manual name mangling. And if you look into the symbols of this um, compiled D code, you will see these names which match exactly the source code. I have to remind uh, everyone that extern C does not mean this is a C function. It only deals with a function interface. It only um, deals with how the symbols are uh, compiled how the names are mangled, and also what can appear on a function interface, what parameter types and what return types can appear. Otherwise, inside an extern C function, you can use as much D as you want. For example, in this extern C function foo, I'm creating a range object using it and putting my result into an out parameter. There's also extern C++, which is outside of our uh, presentation topics today. So extern C function interfaces must obey certain rules. Fundamental D types that have C counterparts can appear on an extern C function interface. For example, int, double, etc. But one must be careful. D has specific type widths. For example, int is a 32-bit in entity on the D side. C does not define this. C int can be 16, 8, 32, whatever, depending on the platform. In order to match a D int to a C side int, we have to use these special type definitions int 32t from standard int.h, for example. Structs can appear as is. These structs were uh, designed to be ABI compatible with C structs, so if you have a D struct, it can appear on a function interface as is. The function keyword can appear on an extern C function interface because D's function is the same as a C function pointer. D arrays can appear only if they are represented as a pair of parameters like a length and a pointer to first element. Otherwise the fat pointer slice concept that we enjoy in D cannot traverse an extern C function interface. Um, strings can appear either as arrays or zero terminated strings as C uses them conventionally. Expressly not supported are associative arrays of D, 
classes and delegates. They don't have counterparts on the C side. Here's an example D function, external C. So even though this function takes four parameters, conceptually it takes three parameters. The first two represent an array as a pair of length and a pointer. The second conceptual parameter is a zero terminated string. That's why I called it strz. Um, and the th fourth uh, parameter, which corresponds to our third conceptual parameter, is an out parameter. That's why it's a pointer to a double. We will dereference it to put our result in. D has a very nice convenient syntax of making a D slice from a pair of length and a pointer. And it's this syntax. If you say pointer and square bracket zero to length, now it's a slice that knows its size that will uh, do bounce checking by default. This operation is no copy and the minimal cost is just two 8-byte um, members in your local scope. When it comes to converting C zero terminated strings to D strings, you can call from string Z, which is again a no copy operation, very efficient. However, just like string length needs to go and find the first zero byte in a string, from string Z needs to do that to figure out the length of this string. But otherwise, other than walking the memory, this operation is also no copy. And this is the third conceptual parameter that we put our result, which is 2.5 in this case, by dereferencing the out parameter. The C header file of a D library like this would be almost one-to-one -one identical, except the int that I mentioned earlier. Our int on the D side must be written as int32t on the C side. And because size t and int32t are defined in certain header files, we need to include those header files as well. So the C code using this D library that we just looked at, this D library function, can, um, must first of all include our header file. So they get our function declaration. Here's an array with three elements, a hard-coded length as three, which need not be hard-coded of course, but for this example I chose three, a local result variable, which we will get a pointer of as our out parameter, and the D function is called with the length and pointer um, pair for the array. A string is coming in, zero terminated string, and the address of result is coming in as our out parameter. Error propagation is an important topic. This exception hierarchy has throwable type at the top, and we have two descendants of it, exception, which represent recoverable errors, and error, which represent irrecoverable errors. Thanks to exceptions, we D programmers take advantage of this feature and we normally return our results from our functions. For example, this foo function is returning my result type. It may throw or an exception or throw an error by these two examples. Enforce expressions throw exceptions, assert expressions return um, throw errors. So we reserve the return type for our result and throw exceptions as our error management. C does not have exceptions, cannot understand exceptions. That's why we will not be able to emit exceptions, leak exceptions to our caller. In C, return value is reserved for the error code. Zero error code means success, non-zero means error something went wrong. So for that reason, C functions must return their results as out parameters. Here's a C code that's equ the equivalent of the previous one. It has to return int, takes its result as an out parameter. It checks a condition. If there's an error, returns one, otherwise puts a result in the out parameter and returns zero for success. So we have to translate the exceptions to error codes. One way of doing this is on our external C library functions, we can wrap everything in try catch blocks. And in a sense, we have to. 
for example, once we have this <coughs> try block, we can do whatever the function does and finally put our result into the out parameter and return zero. If we catch an exception, we can print an error on a standard error stream and then return one, indicating an error. I will improve on this code later on because std error may not even exist in the environment that we're executing. And because we are dealing with a library code here, we may not know anything about the application, the program that's calling us. So this is some wishful uh, error management, error logging that I'm doing on this slide. We will improve upon this later. Likewise, we can catch error separately, print something on the standard error stream again. But now, because error represents an irrecover irrecoverable error, some illegal state in the program, we have choices. Um, being responsible asks us to abort immediately. And this is what I've done in my yesterday's presentation. So option is to abort. Or we can return a special error code and hope that the caller will check this number two versus number one and detect there was an irrecoverable error. Since we cannot know what the actual application is doing, whether it's a safety critical application, whether it's a game or some command line tool, because we can't in general decide, maybe our library should have a function allowing our users to configure us what to do in the case of an error. So we, might, we may have a function saying abort if error or return to if error. So better than just returning int, like most C functions do, we can actually return a status uh, object, which encapsulates the error code, status code, and optionally some error message if something happened. So all of my functions from now on will return status instead of int. And the C definition of this uh, struct will be almost identical in our library's header file int32 code, const char pointer error message, and um, <laughs> defining structs may not be as straightforward as it is in D in C, so you need to do this type def trick. There are other ways, but I chose to do this one. No throw is a D keyword, which guarantees that a function does not emit any exception derived from the exception hierarchy. It can still uh, emit exceptions derived from error because we don't uh, want to block the serious irrecoverable error cases. For that reason, just to be safe, even though we will have a try catch block in all of our library functions, we want to use no throw on our library interface functions to guarantee that we will not emit an exception. So Instead of wrapping every library function in a try-catch block, we will use, or <laughs> I wrote, a tried function template. In this case, the function template takes a callable object, which I called func, which also receives the function name, the context name where this is being called in as a parameter. All this tried function template does is try to execute func, it does its own business, then we return status zero and with a message success, even though we reserved it to every message, I just chose to return success in this case. So when we catch an exception, this time we will return status error code one and we will use the exceptions error message as our error message in the status object. So this is what I meant as to improve upon printing something on the std error stream. We will just return this object and let the application decide what to do with that message. They can print it on standard error stream or they can log it into a file, whatever mechanism they have for error reporting. Now brace yourselves, the catching errors is a little bigger because I annotated my tried function with no throw, I cannot use throwing uh, expressions in this code, in this function. That's why I can't use 
uh, to string functions. I can't use right formatted lines of D. I resort to uh, C's, uh, D's C uh, underlying C library and use fprintf from the good old C. Because C libraries don't know any exceptions, none of these the C functions can throw. So I'm using fprintf to print something on std error. And I don't even convert anything to uh, string z's in here. I'm actually using the error objects file and message um, as well as the function name in this context strings, these strings, without needing a zero termination at the end. Because fprintf has the facility to print certain number of characters from certain number of pointer. So I'm using that facility to make up this um, error message to print it on std error. Even though I discussed that maybe I don't know whether a std error out there or whether I should abort or not, for this example, I'm choosing to print and abort. As I said, your library can uh, behave differently. So with this tried function template, now all my library functions can be of this structure. No throw extern C returning status. And the entire functionality of my interface functions can be wrapped in tried as lambda functions, where I um, highlight with the, the curly braces of the lambda function are highlighted. And this will be very convenient. We need to talk about argument lifetimes. Here is a library function that is receiving two, conceptually two arguments, a string from the C world, and this is of course a zero terminated string, and an array of strings. We know the length of the strings in this array, and we receive a pointer to pointer a char, to a char pointer, which is the way C uh, describes arrays of strings. So um, D standard library has from string Z, as we've seen earlier, which makes a D string from a zero terminated string. As I said, there is no copy. This is a view into the existing bytes of a C string. Making a range of these strings from a C array of C strings can be, can be achieved with this cheap operation. As we've seen, uh, the number two there, and no copy that I say, strings zero dot dot length makes a slice into these uh, C strings. And when we map every element of that slice through from string Z, now we get D strings, a D slice of these strings. So going back, using from string Z in our library functions is safe because the C side created a string called us with that data. We can use that data right away, as I'm doing here with right formatted line. I'm using those strings to print something on the screen. However, storing those strings for later use is not fine. We can't do this because once the C function calls us and we use this string, once we go back, that string may disappear. It might have been in a local buffer. For that reason, if the string passed to our library needs to be stored for later use, we have to call idup on it after pass passing it through from string z. idup means immutable duplicate, which basically makes a copy of a string and gives us a d string out of it. In this case, because I need this, the value of the string to open a file, because I'm giving it to file, and because it requires a proper string, I need to make this idup assign it to that file member. Likewise, the second conceptual argument here, the array of strings, cannot be used like what I did on the earlier slide. slide. I can still use string zero dot dot length to generate a slice. I can still map, still map all of the elements of that slice through from string Z, but now I need to call idup to make my own copy, D side copy of the strings, as well as at the end, I need to call dot array to make an array of them, which 
belongs to the D side before assigning it to ARR variable in this case, presumably for later use. Now in this case, idups do copy, that array does allocate. I have to pay that price. As a fun optimization exercise, I realize that it is possible to put all the strings and all the arrays in a single block of memory, maybe a, an array of bytes, but I didn't show anything like that here. I just called idup per string and array on that um, array of strings. We need to talk about the converse operation of D object lifetimes that we pass to the C side. To string Z means make zero terminated string from D string. It is fine for immediate use on the C side. For example, when our library function is called and somehow we make a string by using the 42 value and then we call to string Z on that string, which allocates memory to make a zero terminated string, we can put this temporary variable into the out parameter for the C side to use. This is safe. However, as soon as we leave this function scope, as I said, we leave the function scope, the C side can safely use this string. But our function must document that the C side cannot hold on to this string, to this reference, because the D side does not have any reference for the garbage collector to keep that string alive. From the point of view of the D runtime, from the point of view of the D garbage collector, that there's no reference, there's no such reference. We must document if the C side wants to use it for later, they have to make a copy of it. Uh, so th the GC resources are not safe to store on the C side as is. We have other options. In some cases, a string that we generate, that we pass to the C side, also may be useful for us. It may be a key that the C, C side may come for us and we may need to compare what they come to us later on with what, what we stored. So the options for storing on the D side are, we can either put something on a local variable or in this example, it's a module variable. So whatever this code puts into the out parameter for the C side to be consumed, it also puts it into a const char pointer variable on the D side, so the garbage collector has a reference to it. In this case, the temporary string that's created will be alive as long as N keeps the reference for it. The other option is to be more explicit about it. And if, if we don't have a variable to store this string in, we can call GC add root with this variable, telling the GC, please keep this alive. There's a user for it. Uh, the converse operation of add root is remove root, which we will use uh, see in a, in a uh, slide later on. So is to string Z a pessimization? <clears throat> because to, to string Z doesn't know much about what's happening, it eagerly allocates new memory, one character more than what is in a string, and copies that string, puts a zero termination at the end. Assuming make string 42 here returns a string, we may do better in certain cases. If we take make string 42 into a local string variable, and then we append a zero termination at the end of it, then put the dot pointer of that temporary string into the out parameter, sometimes there will be no allocation. The reason for this is, if make string is, for example, a pure function that returns a string, the return string itself already has some capacity in most cases for extra characters. So the zero termination will be overriding one of the capacity bytes there, and this will be a very cheap operation. Or if we're formatting a string to send to the C side, 
there's no reason to call to string z because we can put a zero termination right inside the formatted string ourselves. And likely this will cause no extra allocation at all. Third option, if what we're giving to the C side is already a, a string literal, string literals already have a zero termination at the end, so we don't need to call to string Z on these. And also note there's no need for a dot PTR on a string literal. It readily is, can be converted to a, a C style string variable. C library interfaces usually are uh, similar to object-oriented designs. There's usually some state and there are some functions that work with that state. So a library interface involves an opaque handle that represents that state, a constructor and destructor of that state, or in some, which is sometimes called an initialization and deinitialization of that state, but they correspond to our concept of construction and destruction and a number of functions that work with that state. Additionally, for a D library, if the library is not already linked by a D compiler, the initialization of the D runtime and the de initialization of the D runtime must be taken into consideration. So from this point on, uh, thinking that I've already covered everything that we had to talk about, I will give a library example, a D library example that we will expose to C. For this library, I will use this uh, function line range, which returns a range object. So our library will be about this range object state. Basically, we will expose a D range functionality to C. So this function line range after checking that the file name is not empty, creates a file by line um, range, which will go through the lines of that file by line by line. It will get rid of empty um, characters, white space at the beginning and end of lines. It will filter out empty lines, filter out the ones that start with the hash character, presumably because they are the comment lines, and this range object is what we will expose. We will provide five functions on our library for the construction, destruction of this state, as well as three functions that we all know very well from these ranges, which will make our state an input range. Empty, whether we're done with the lines of this file, front, the uh, current line that we are iterating over and pop front will get rid of it and take us to the second, um, the next line of the file. So when it comes to using the opaque handle of this D object on the C side, we may decide to use that object as is. However, range objects make it difficult because range objects are usually by-value objects that live in our local function call stacks. As we see in this function, the function just returns an object and the caller of this function on the D side would just use it. So we cannot new such objects which are used by value generally. And in general, there is a more state that goes along with such state anyway. And in general, there is some additional behavior like data translation that needs to be done. For that reason, we will wrap that D object, range object, in a struct, which I call line range in this case. The first line is just getting the type of the line range function, which gives us the famously unmentionable type of that complicated range object. So we alias that to be the capital LR and we have a member lowercase lr of that type. So we wrapped it in this struct. The C header of our library will mention this line range struct opaquely as a void pointer. So we will type def is a, it as a void pointer. It is possible to make it opaque by simply declaring it as a void, but it requires using one extra star when it comes to using it, so I'm not gonna use it. I choose void pointer in this case. Let's continue with building our wrapper struct. The first two lines we've already seen, 
they uh, give us the LR member. The constructor takes the same typed object and puts it into our member and calls the prime member function, which sets a front member of this struct to either null if the original range is empty or to a zero terminated string that is readily usable by C. So we will use it in the future. So our prime function prepares the front element for us. There will be three more members of this struct now and they will define the input, input range functionality. Empty is trivially dispatching the call to the object empty, returning whatever it returns. Front, thanks to these uh, compile time duct typing ability, is just a member here, it's not a function. And pop front again dispatches to the wrapped range object and calls prime to prepare our front object for next use, for next iteration. Now I will get to the five functions that uh, use this state. First of them is the constructor, which is the most complicated, I would say. And I put four stickies, pink stickies in here to talk about. I will not talk about any one of those in detail for the later functions. So let's go through the code from the beginning. This is a library function that's for that reason, it's no throw, extern C, returns a status object. And I name mangled this to be line range underscore CTOR, meaning constructor. It takes a line range pointer to pointer. This will be our out parameter. We will put the constructed object into that pointer. We will dereference that pointer to put our result in. We get a file name in. So the caller will give us a file name and we will traverse that file by, by lines. Okay, number one sticky is about the tried uh, function that we mentioned. We wrap everything in tried. Number two, just we just make sure that the parameters we received are sane. We can't work if they are null, so we enforce they are not null. Number three is the most interesting and the most complicated expression. We start with file name. Knowing that this is a zero terminated C string, we call from string Z on it. So we have a D slice and no copy D slice from it. Because we need to maintain the uh, name of the file for later use by the file um, object, we need to I dupe it. We need to duplicate it. So we have our own copy of it. The string goes into the line range function. This is the one with the lowercase l. The line range function produces that complicated uh, range object and returns it. The returned object is given to the line range constructor to be wrapped. And the line range wrapper object happens to live in the dynamic mem memory because I'm constructing it with new. This pointer we put inside the out parameter that we received. We dereference LR parameter, put it there. And we also, number four, tell the garbage collector, you will not have any more reference to this dynamic object, but please keep it alive. We will use it until the caller tells us not to. The C header that corresponds to our library function D function is again almost one to one with one star missing because line range is already defined to be a void pointer in our um, as our opaque handle. And the C user example needs to create a line range handle for our functionality. They may or may not set it to null. They call our function with the address of that handle. So we create the state and put it in there. Destructor is simpler. There's almost nothing to talk about it, except two things. One, this function doesn't care whether the line range coming in is null or not. It will just work. Mm. Even if it's null, we will just skip the operation. Destroy is a function, a D library function, standard library function that calls the destructor of an object. So in order to destroy this line range object, we destroy star LR. 
And note here, destroy LR alone would compile and work, but may not do what you wanted, because in that case it would destroy the pointer object itself. And because a local pointer parameter that we receive here doesn't have any code to execute to destroy a pointer itself, it will be almost it will be a no op. So you must remember that to dereference the pointer to destroy the actual object. And finally, we tell the garbage collector now you can remove this pointer um, because the user is telling us they are done with it. So the garbage collector can reuse the memory for something else. The C header that corresponds to our library function is trivial. Again, note one star missing from the parameter. And the C user example would be they will call the line range destructor with a handle they have. Empty function, because it produces a result, it takes an int pointer out parameter, makes sure nothing is null, and calls the wrapped object empty function and puts it in the out parameter. If you're not used to these um, pointer syntax, you may notice if you're a C or C++ programmer especially, you may notice that even though LR is a pointer, I'm not using any arrow operator here. LR.empty works like the arrow operator, as in C and C++. This will dereference the LR pointer and call empty on the object that that pointer points to. And in fact, we don't even have the arrow operator in D. We use D, uh, we use dot for pointers as well. The C header that corresponds to this function, again, needs to make sure int32t 32, int 32 is defined. I think it's very similar to the earlier ones, trivial. And the C user must have a local empty variable of type int32t and give us the, the, pre, uh, the address of it so, so that we can put the result in. And here's the front function, very similarly. This time it takes a string out parameter and trivially we put our object's front member in there. If you remember from earlier, the prime function has already called to string z and whatever we have in this LR object is readily usable by the C side. So it goes there easily. Header file is trivial and the user example, again, they create a line object, give us the address of it, we put it in so they can use it. Last function is pop front. Seems to be trivial again. We just check in this case when they come to us as a pop front, we make sure uh, the pointer is not null. Um, C header file is simple, C user case is trivial. The, whatever handle they have, they give us to us. So initializing the D runtime is very important because our code deals with uh, memory allocations um, using the D standard library. We use the garbage collector, we use the D runtime and this must be initialized. Luckily, um, shared library loaders know how to initialize libraries if, you, uh, if we specify that they are library initialization and deinitialization functions. The D language has a pragma called CRT constructor, which um, stands for C runtime constructor. If you put this on an extern C int returning no parameter taking function like this, that function will be called by the loader and you can put your initialization code in here. In this case, all I need to do is call RT in it to initialize the D runtime. Conversely, Pragma CRT destructor is called when a library is unloaded. And in this case, in this function, I'm calling RT term. You can have as many of such functions as you need. They can do their own different kind of initializations. They will all be executed before or after. All right, and as you can see, the entire code, the everything that I've talked about fits on a single slide. Um, this has everything that I've talked about. If you squint a little on the right hand side, you can tell the pattern of the five library functions that we uh, defined to be called from the C side. And this is the mylibrary.h file of the library, which contains everything that I've shown piecemeal earlier. 
the status struct, the opaque line range handle, and the five functions that the users will be calling. And here is an example of a user. Denima.c is a C program. Um, everything on the right hand side is the code that deals with our um, state, the D library state. You can tell the constructor and destructor are executed before and after an unconditional loop, which loops until empty becomes um, true. You can see empty front and pop front being called and used in there. You may notice that even though languages like C that receive error codes as function returns, they must almost always have two uh, lines for every call. Make a call and check the error code. Make a call and check the error code. In this case, you don't see that check the error code because I'm hiding checking the error code behind a call macro, which is defined on the left hand side. Call calls the function specified with the variable number of arguments, assigns the returned value to status, and then calls another macro, executes another macro, bail error, which checks whether the status code is zero or not. If it's not zero, indicating a failure, it goes to finally. So go to finally will take us to the finally block of this C program, this C function. And the line range destructor is actually inside the finally block to clean up. So this is automated error code in C. Some modern languages that require you to return errors as on the return type does not give you, unfortunately, facilities to deal with automatic error management like this. For example, I used the Go programming language for one year for a microservices product project, and I was always bothered with failing to automate error management. But here we can see C can do this. As we will see later on, Python will be similarly uh, automatic. So building our uh, D library is done with the dash shared command line option. You can give it to DMD. And in this case, our output file name is libmylibrary.so. The C program can be produced with GCC, um, which takes our libmylibrary.so with some other linker flags, which requires that this example, all of the functions, all of the files that I've shown need to be in the same directory for this example. And then before executing the C program, let me remind you what the range object, the D range object was. We would open a file, iterate it line by line, strip, strip extra white space from the beginning and end of the lines, filter out the empty ones, the ones that start with a, a hash character. And if we use this test file, which has a comment, two empty lines and some um, white space around the lines and execute it with the D program, we see that everything comes to our D side and we see Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday printed by the C program. Okay, we've managed calling D code as a C library from a C program. Now we can call the same library from most other languages, including Python. Calling our library from Python is again a very trivial task. Python has the C types package. I, here I'm importing everything from the C types facility. CDLL is a C types feature where when you say dot load library and give it a string, it finds and loads that library. And now my library happens to be a handle to our D library. The Python class that corresponds to our library's status struct can be defined like this as a Python class. Uh, what we see in parentheses there structure is again a feature of the C types package. We define the fields of this struct as an int32 code and a char pointer, C char pointer error message, exactly matching we had. Um, as a tip, I had huge um, I wasted a lot of time at one point because I typed fields with two underscores before, underscores before and after. 
I could not get anything working and I spent maybe two hours on this. Finally, I realized I was mistyping fields with two underscores. I really expected a better error reporting from Python in this case. Even though I used this standard as a result type, Status did not tell me I was missing a crucial fields um, member in this class. So defining a callable of RD library can be done in this fashion, but I will automate this. I will make this easier on the next slide. The first line, line range constructor, uses the my library handle saying my, range con my uh, line range constructor is the same as the line range constructor in the library, the symbol in the library. This callable has a result type, which happens to be status, which we decided, uh, defined earlier. And for this callable, I want to use a check status function as my errors checker. So this is how Python's C type automates errors checking. And check status is this function that I wrote. Check status receives the status object after calling a callable, receives the function and the arguments. But in this case, I'm just looking at the status code. If it's not zero, indicating a failure, I'm raising a runtime error, which means I'm translating my C library's error code to a Python exception by using the error message that's already in the status object. And note that because the world, the side uses UTF-8 strings, I need to decode this error message from UTF-8. So we've seen only one um, definition of a callable. It was the constructor. If we write a declare func um, function, which wraps everything that we do for every callable, then we can just call that declare func or maybe we can we should um, name it differently saying make callable perhaps and everything is automated handled by that function so we only add these five lines to our python program to have callable objects that correspond to our um, d library that we exposed as a c library here's a python user example just like in the c code they create an lr handle which must be a C void pointer type. Their file name is myfile.txt, exactly what we used in our uh, test program. And in this case, before a Python string comes to us, it must be encoded in UTF-8 because that's what we understand. And then it calls line range constructor. Because the handle must be an out parameter on our side, they have to call it by ref before coming to us. And here is the single slide Python program that does all of this. If you look at the highlighted part, you will realize it's almost the same code as the C code. No errors checking done manually. Everything is handled by the check status function. And this again has an unconditional loop, loops until it finds an empty state from our library function. Executing the Python, again, assuming that everything is in one directory, requires ld library path equals dot. So executing it produces the same Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday lines from that test file. I have one more slide talking about using our D library that we expose as a C library from a D program itself. I made a mistake of uh, opening this library, loading this library with DL open, which is a POSIX feature that you, you might think of using. But don't do that because DL open does not know anything about the D runtime. You must call load library from the D's uh, core runtime module because load library, as the documentation describes, um, will integrate the D runtime of the library with the current runtime of the main program. That concludes my presentation. First of all, if you want to expose your D code to Python, use AutoWrap. You will be happy. It's magic. Otherwise, work methodically as I've done, as I've shown here, to expose a C library interface. And you can use it from Python 
with, for example, C-types. Thank you very much for listening.